Uh, welcome to Alden Library. I am Scott Seaman, Dean of Libraries, and this is a very special evening tonight. We are celebrating the release of President Charles Ping's new book, uh, jointly published by Alden Library and the Ohio University Press. The book is titled A Conversation uh, About Ohio University and the Presidency, 1975 to 1994. Now, some of you may not be aware, but the Libraries has a tradition of publishing uh, the memoirs of Ohio University's presidents. That tradition, interestingly enough, was begun by President Ping. Uh, it was later supported by President Glidden. It was called the Oral History Program. The first history published was that of John Baker, followed by Vernon Alden, Harry Crewson, Claude Soule, and now Ohio University's 18th president, Charlie Ping. Now the title of the new book comes from its format. It's a conversation. It's a transcribed conversation between Dr. Ping and Professor Sam Crow. Sam Crow is trustee professor of English here at Ohio University, and he's author of numerous works, including Shakespeare Observed, studies and performance on screen, as well as many other publications. So we're fortunate to have both Dr. Ping and Professor Crowell here tonight to give a flavor of what's inside this book. So please join me in welcoming them. Welcome. Uh, we did this before. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want me to just lower my voice? We okay on the sound now? Um, we're each going to make a little prefatory remark or statement, and then we're going to try to give you some of the flavor of the book by my re-asking, and perhaps not the identical form, but in the general form, some of the questions that propelled the conversation that President Ping and I had um, in one of the studios up on the third or fourth floor of WOUB TV um, uh, in May of 1911, 1911, <laughs> excuse me, of 2011. Um, I want to add that there, while the uh, main body of interviews in the book were conducted between the two of us, that after I had worn out uh, asking Charlie questions, uh, Doug McCabe, who is the very fine uh, curator of manuscripts in the library, did it, the last interview in the book. And to my way of thinking, it's the best, because he was not quite as close to the action as I was, and so he stands back a bit from the um, uh, lived experience of the Ping administration and asks, I think, some wonderful broader questions and elicits from Charlie some, I, I think, particularly potent answers that I hadn't gotten to. Um, I make this plug because I think he does did wonderful work, but it's also Doug is a former student back from the early 1970s when I was just a young puppy here. And then he went off in the world, married, raised a, started to raise a family, came back for alumni college and said, I should never have left. And so he came back to school and got a master's in history with a specialty in archival work, got a job at the library and has been here ever since. So. I'm delighted that he's a part of this family. Okay, Charlie, um, uh, go ahead and tell us about um, the um, troubles with memoirs. Well, uh, this is an author's night, so I want to make a confession at the start. Uh, I published a number of books and many articles. This was the easiest book I ever did. Uh, Sam just got me talking, and anyone my age wants to talk about the past, and that's what I did. The past has far more reality than the future uh, at this point in life. Uh, I expressed to Sam, uh, as we were starting, a certain reservation. Uh, and frankly, Scott, I, for I forgot that I had started the whole process. Uh, 
my reservation is about memoirs in the sense that they are frequently self-serving because you remember the past through the prism of the present and that tends to distort and change. And what you may well have thought you had planned carefully was actually a product of a whole variety of other circumstances. Having said that, uh, much to my surprise, I thoroughly enjoyed this. Uh, Sam had been after me to do it, and I kept saying no. And uh, finally, I had a serious accident, and I think everybody got concerned about mortality, and so it had an urgency, and I agreed to do it. And much to my surprise, the nine taping sessions, we had nine two-hour sessions, uh, proved to be fun. Uh, and I think, Sam, you made it that way. But it was an easy book in part because of the exceptional work of the library staff, Scott, and all who work with him. And uh, Doug's work as producer and Sam, your questioning and commenting uh, is always provocative. I have sat through one of your Shakespeare classes and watched you do it with your students. And it was fun to have it uh, in person. All right, I think I've uh, finished my introductory <laughs> statement. I think, Where do you want to go? Okay, I want to ask you the first question, but before that, one of the things that the book doesn't tell you that you should all know, which is one of the remarkable things about Charlie, is that after um, he, he didn't retire uh, after he stepped down as president and went on to run a number of other um, programs and, uh, and national institutions. Uh, he came back and took my Shakespeare class with his grandson. And they took Shakespeare's tragedies from me <laughs> sometime in the mid-1990s. And the thing I remember best is Sam, his grandson, uh, was a wonderful student, a very bright lad, but he never said much in class until the one day his grandfather cut. And he talked a lot that day. <laughs> <laughs> and I was happy uh, that, that had, he had a chance to open up when grandfather wasn't there. Charlie, in 1975, Ohio University was in crisis. We'd lost something like 6,000 students in three or four years. The 1960s hadn't really ended here. The students were still up in arms. Uh, the faculty were threatening to unionize and in fact had taken a vote, a quasi uh, um, unofficial straw poll that indicated a strong preference uh, for unionizing. A n great number of the classified staff had been laid off. Most of the untenured professors had been laid off and there were even plans to maybe uh, get rid of some tenured professors. Uh, the university just started to stumbled from one bad moment to another. And because we had this wonderful school of journalism here, anything bad that happened on campus was immediately known all around the country because they were all stringers for somebody. And it was all topped off for me by in the uh, summer of uh, 75, one of the two great summers of the big red machine over in Cincinnati. One of our students took off his clothes and streaked across the outfield at Riverfront Stadium. And when he was arrested by the cops, was asked, why did you do that? He said it was on an assignment from his art class at Ohio University. <laughs> <laughs> and I know who the professor was. <laughs> Charlie, why in the world were you interested in Ohio University in 1975? Well, some of you have heard me tell a couple of the stories, but they're worth repeating. Uh, when I, my first contact was the sort of informal letter, you've been nominated, are you interested? And I wrote back, no. Uh, some time passed and Alan Booth, who was a, a history professor at the time and chair of the faculty senate, called me. I was now on leave uh, in the uh, advanced management program of the business school. At Harvard. <laughs> At Harvard, yeah. It's a three-month cloistered program, and uh, 
very high powered. And anyway, this call from Allen came and he said, if some of the committee flew up to Boston, would you meet with them? And I said, well, that's very flattering. Of course I would. And uh, a number of the members of the committee flew up to Boston and we met in Vern Alden's office. He was then CEO, chairman of uh, the first Boston company, I think. And we had two hours of very warm and cordial conversation and I enjoyed the conversation and they seemed to respond and the time came when they had to leave and go back to the airport. And Vern said to me, please stay for a minute. And I did, and he said, I want to show you something. He took me into his dressing room, and there on the wall was a large plaque, and mounted on the plaque were portions of bricks and rock and pipe and two-by-fours. And uh, I'm looking at it thinking, what in the world is this? And he said, those are all the things that were thrown through my window <laughs> during my years as president. <laughs> and then there was a pause. It said, Marion and I regard those years as the best years of our lives. Anyway, I went back to the business school and uh, decided that the intense commitment of this group had caught my interest interest enough that I went around talking and I talked to some of the corporate officials from Ohio and without exception I got a response from them. The response was, don't touch it. <laughs> I sure wouldn't send my daughter there. And then I went around to faculty who were friends and I got just the opposite response. Oh, this is a gem. Do look at it. Well, that's an intriguing kind of contrast. And uh, a little time went by, Alan called and said, would you be willing to come out and meet with the full committee and perhaps visit the campus? And I said, yes, but one condition. It's to be understood that I am not a candidate until I have been out there and talked to people, and then I'll decide whether I'm going to be a candidate. I don't want anything coming back to the campus that had given me this leave, and uh, well, Alan Booth uh, collected all the chits he had with the Post, and though they knew about it, it didn't get uh, published until later, and uh, we came into town and were taken directly to the home of a faculty member who had children, our age of our children. And the whole thing was planned so beautifully uh, because we were concerned about the public schools. We had two children in high school at the time. And uh, anyway, to make a long story shorter, uh, I met enough faculty that I really had a sense of the kind of people that I'd be working with. And uh, their intense commitment to the institution, uh, I've been on lots of campuses, uh, is uh, unusual and very important. Uh, so I agreed to become a candidate. And from that, uh, things progressed. Uh, now, Sam, I understood the problems. I had read uh, all the financial reports, and they were alarming. But we had uh, a couple of things going for us. The uh, Legislature had appropriated $3 million in special funding to bail us out. Uh, we were tottering on the edge of default of millions of dollars in bonded indebtedness. And uh, they had also passed legislation establishing a college of osteopathic medicine. 
Uh, I thought uh, both were indications of promise for the future. Mostly, well, however, was the place and the people, like so many, uh, my first visit here, just to walk a campus in the Midwest that has a sense of history is a wonderful thing. What were um, some of the early challenges? You've already mentioned the, uh, the legislature approving the, the, uh, the creation of a College of Osteopathic Medicine here, but they had a, a timetable that <laughs> um, is rather astounding. You want to talk about that? The, those well, first... faculty senate hadn't approved it yet. No, and that's right. And, uh, to my surprise, there was some opposition within that group. Anyway, uh, John Baker has a wonderful line in his oral history. He said he arrived on the scene in 1945, and he got a number of surprises. <laughs> uh, he found out the College of Business was not accredited. The Engineering College was not accredited. There were no PhD programs and there was no arm for raising private funding. All of which he thought, well, I got some surprises too. One of which was reading the bill establishing the medical school and finding the provision there that said, uh, if we failed to admit our first class of at least 16 students, Within one year, there would be no further funding. Now, that's unheard of. You don't open a medical school in one year. You have to recruit a faculty. You have to put in place an admissions process. You have to develop a curriculum. Uh, but somehow, we did it. Then uh, on the bonded indebtedness, I read uh, the instruments with some care and discovered to my surprise and alarm that there was a provision in there that the bondholders had first claim on any income other than appropriations. You see what that meant? If we had in fact been unable to pay him, then tuition would have gone to bond payments. And I discovered the convocation center was still on a construction loan, which means this is 1975, 76, means it turns over each year at the current interest rate. And we were right on the cusp of the period when interest rate went out of sight. Uh, there were. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> many challenges. <laughs> For the students in the audience, the, the um, bonded indebtedness was a major issue because we had built dorms that had a capacity for holding about 9,000 students. And those dorms had been built on bonds when we lost uh, the great decline in undergraduate enrollment. We suddenly had 3,000 less students filling those beds, but they still had to be paid for. So that was the, why the system was teetering on a financial disaster. But interestingly enough, you were able to turn that to an advantage. Well, we took many of the buildings and turned them to other purposes. The first building in the medical school was Grosvenor Hall. And uh, it was... The funds were appropriated. Uh, Bill Dromdowski, who's in the audience, will appreciate that funds were appropriated. We went out to bid and contracts were awarded in 30 days. Now that's really quite, usually it takes seven years from the time uh, buildings are appropriated. And uh, when the first class came in that fall, they were still nailing and working in the Grosvenor. And then we took another uh, complex off uh, for the engineering college. And we did that for a number of uh, units and went to the legislature and said, all right, we're turning these to academic purposes, but we still have the bonded indebtedness. 
you buy out the buildings that we're converting. And they agreed, uh, including one that stood on the college, on the, across from the college green, uh, the corner of College Street and Union. Uh, somebody just <laughs> called it. <laughs> Howard Hall. Howard Hall was built originally as a hotel and the university took it on. It had wooden struts and uh, you couldn't, by code, use it as a resident hall. So we tore it down. Now, it was still part of the pool of places whose income was supposed to retire the debt. So the legislature bought Howard Hall. <laughs> and uh, it was not uncommon when I'd testify at a budget hearing to have a legislator look at me quizzically and say, aren't you the fellow that sold us a building you'd already torn, torn down? <laughs> and I was. <laughs> But we lowered the annual debt service by more than a half million dollars as a result. That, and we did a lot of other things to address the problem. Um, by inclination, by training, by, um, I think, all a sense of who you are as a man, um, you're a philosopher. And you were most struck in your studies by Plato and Hegel, who were two idealists. Uh, idealists tend not to be people who sell buildings to the legislature that they've torn down. Um, but somehow you took what you had learned in graduate school and as a professor from Plato and Hegel and merged it with some ideas that you picked up at the Harvard School for um, Management to create a sort of um, unique management system and style here, and I'd, I'd like you to talk a bit about putting in place the planning process, which you did in those early years. Well, it took a few years, mostly because uh, people were sick and tired of planning. They'd planned and planned and planned, and all they got were problems. Uh, and we went through a series of steps uh, trying to identify the basic understanding of what the university was here to do and how was it to do it. Uh, now, that's idealism. You first start with the ideal model, and then you try to speak to the ways the actual relates to the ideal. Uh, so the first part of it was to begin to get the campus really thinking coherently uh, rather than defensively uh, about basic goals. Then we needed a process where the people involved could take ownership. So we divided all the campus uh, into a series of planning units so that the library was a planning unit. Each of the colleges were a planning unit. Physical plant was a planning unit and so on. And uh, we had this group describe what changes that they would bring over time. And we organized a, uh, uh, what we called UPAC, University Planning Advisory Committee. It was basically advisory to me and through me to the trustees. And uh, the committee was made up uh, largely of faculty, deans, and students, and a handful of administrators. And each of the units would submit 
and it would be reviewed so that we were weighing the issue of the need for a bulldozer to move coal as opposed to increasing the library budget for uh, books. Everything was in a real sense in tension with everything else. And uh, to my delight and surprise, it worked. There was a sense of ownership. And UPAC did in fact put on their university hat rather than uh, their particular college or department or <laughs> organization within the university. One and, of the things, oh, sorry, go, didn't no, mean to interrupt ahead. you. Go One ahead. of the uh, elements that came out of that early um, planning uh, was something that you were vitally interested in, which was the core curriculum, liberal studies, general education, those um, sets of courses or academic experiences that the faculty determines is unique and important to define what an Ohio University education is or a Ohio Wesleyan education on that campus, etc. And it's often difficult to do because faculty, we are all trained in our disciplines and often our first loyalties, not often, always almost, our first loyalties uh, intellectually are to our disciplines and it's hard to get us out of thinking just in those terms to think in broader terms about the, the shape of the curriculum that all the students are going to take some of. We, um, and many universities across the country, part of the student revolt in the 60s had been to get away from common requirements because in large part they'd probably been in place for 30 or 40 years and that's about the life cycle of these things. And the faculty were happy to give them up. Uh, it was one less thing that they had to worry about communally. I think the faculty here discovered after three or four years, but the, maybe that had been a mistake, whether they were ready to really um, get down to the hard work of imagining something new rather than just reestablishing what had been old, um, I'm not sure. But you took an active role as the president um, in that discussion. And I, I, I think that's um, unique yeah. in many ways. And I want you to talk about it a bit. Well, first of all, it was one of the things that attracted me here. I found a underlying faculty interest in the concept that there ought to be a common core. And I found uh, a genuine commitment to international education, and I found a genuine commitment to undergraduate experience. Well, uh, one of the things I keep on my bookshelf and cherish is the university bulletin for the 1975-76 academic year. It's, uh, it's fun to go back and read it. It's very empty of any sense of common learning or common core. And I understand the resistance that you talked about. And so we put together a committee. Uh, we are, were able to win a grant and we went out to Colorado Springs and this faculty group spent weeks talking to each other and they came back with uh, a report to the faculty. Uh, Professor Nick Dinas of the Engineering College uh, was the first to speak to the report in the fall convocation. Uh, and there was a balance in the committee that helped win. Uh, two years later, the faculty senate had adopted it. Now, that was a surprising and painful process. Uh, and the concept of tears was put in, the concept was put in place as a core for all undergraduate education, that there were certain basic fundamental skills, that there were certain basic areas of study, and that there needed to be, uh, at the end of their experience, some conscious effort to tie things together. 
crossing disciplines. Uh, and I think this core curriculum was the only undergraduate program to be awarded a program excellence award during the brief period that uh, the state of Ohio funded excellence awards. Uh, it was a in, in that response, you mentioned two things um, that were also important to you and were important to the campus, as you said, that was one of the things that attracted you here was the, already the international posture of Ohio University. It was a remarkable fact that this school in the, the sort of out of the way 13 little counties in southwest, southeastern Ohio had this international connection. You want to talk a bit about that and how you then went about to work to build on it? Well, it really goes back to John Baker's day or even much earlier. Uh, it was partially a product of projects so that we worked in Nigeria to help them establish what is essentially a land-grant college. Uh, we worked in Malaysia to try to bring the native Malays into the business life of the country, and so on. Uh, we had a long history of involvement in Botswana and Swaziland, and a lesser involvement in Lesotho and uh, Namibia, all part of the SADC countries. Of, uh, that is, we had faculty who were spending portions of their career working on the campuses in these countries. Uh, we really assisted the government of Botswana to implement the national policy of universal primary education. And I think the people involved in it took great pride in it and I think the leadership of uh, Botswana recognized their contribution. Anyway, and when we did this, it was a conscious effort to get our faculty, not to hire people uh, to do the jobs, which is frequently what is done in project, but to send our faculty so they would come back to campus and teach with new understanding. Uh, we built links to the library. So we have a marvelous Malay collection. Uh, and uh, this is a direct product of the involvement. And most of all, we had a large pool of international students. Interestingly, when I came in 75, the largest number were from Nigeria. Why? Because we'd had a faculty group there for many years. And after Nigeria's economy went on uh, in the doldrums, uh, our largest student group was Malaysian. And at one time we had some 350 Malaysian students on campus. And when the ambassador came to visit, I said, I think this is a mistake because they're creating their own village uh, and we want them interacting with the students from Cleveland or the students from Cincinnati or the students from Gloucester. Uh, and I think it was two things summed up. In 1978, when China made an opening to the West, the first real contact between Chinese higher education and the U.S. was a delegation that came to a number of campuses in the U.S. and we were the only campus in the Midwest that they visited. Uh, and we were among the first campuses the next year to receive students under this opening to the West. Now, they weren't students at all. They were faculty 
who had been displaced by the Cultural Revolution and needed to get back in touch with their discipline. Uh, and only later did the Chinese population turn out to be students. And China succeeded Malaysia as the largest source of students. Uh, and I think there, people like John Cady, a name that will mean something to the old timers in the group, and his work with the Southeast Asia program, which was uh, very, very early for this sort of effort. I once um, spent an evening uh, with a new faculty member here who had actually come from being on the faculty at Penn State. And talking about the two schools, I asked him what he thought the major difference was between Ohio University and Penn State. And he said, well, in many ways, they're very similar. They're located in rural, beautiful areas, and they're bustling universities on the go and on the move. He said what struck him was that there were about the same number of international students on both campuses. But at Penn State, you'd never know the international students were there. While here, we celebrated them. And we ha um, had International Week and uh, that wonderful Saturday on Court Street when all the international students put out their booze of um, local cuisine and, and local dancing or whatever. The, uh, <laughs> I should never have done this. When we did something similar to this, a month ago or three weeks ago, I talked about the flags in the convo, those wonderful flags from all the countries of the students that attend school here. And it makes me proud every time I'm in there because it's that visible sign in an athletic arena uh, of our international presence. When I walked in a week later, they were gone. They're down. And I was told, oh, something so much better is going to take their place. Oh, I'm too old for something better at this point. But anyway, um, I always, I, I like that. That was a, a signal. And not, you know, you and your administration, and you later gave Joel Rudy the credit for that idea, and uh, rightly so. But I, I like the, the way in which we tried to, to make the presence of the international students on campus in southeastern Ohio a part of this university and a part of what it meant to go to school here. And, um, Indeed. And it worked. Um, one of the things that a president has to do that most of us, do is a, a part of his or her life that most of us don't see, is having to deal with the external communities. And we've talked a little bit about your uh, having to deal with the legislature. I know that in Ohio, um, it isn't quite as onerous as in other states where there's a, a pecking order and every university has to go and lobby every year for its budget that in Ohio there's a formula that drives the, that basic need. But nevertheless, you have to deal with uh, legislators and with governors in particular, and you get to know them and you get to know their flavor. And I wish that you'd tell us a tale or two about some of the um, governors of Ohio that you had to deal with and what that was like. Well, uh, when I came, Governor Rhodes was the governor, and then he came back after a term out of office. And uh, Governor Rhodes had uh, about a five second attention span. <laughs> and uh, we went, uh, we needed to replace the old natatorium. It was the most energy inefficient building on campus. It would be uh, sweating hot upstairs and there'd be ice on the floor in the dressing room. It, it really had a lot of problems. And so we were given a grant by Nationwide and we launched a architectural competition, which is how in the best of all possible worlds, all buildings ought to be built. And uh, but we didn't have any funding for it. It did not make the capital bill that emerged from the Board of Regents. Now, the operating budget is not very political in Ohio. It's very formalized, as you said. The capital budget is a political free-for-all. 
So uh, a couple of trustees, uh, Kenner Bush, who was the third generation of his family to be a trustee, editor and publisher of the Messenger, the local paper, and uh, had been state president of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Kenner was a trustee, and Dean Jeffers, who was the president and CEO of Nationwide, uh, a very large and important insurance company. Uh, Kenner and Dean Jeffers went with me to meet with Governor Rhodes. And I had been in his office three or four times. And the whole time you're trying to talk to him, he's taking phone calls, he's talking to three assistants, and he's doing about a half dozen things simultaneously. And this is not multitasking. This is, and uh, we finally, we pled our case, we got up to leave. And Kenner tur turned to Dean and said, Dean, I don't think the governor heard us at all. And Rhodes heard the comment as we were going out the door and he said, Dean, uh, I'll get your old swimming hole in. <laughs> and sure enough, it was in the capital budget. Uh, Rhodes did not like to come on college campuses. I guess the, the, the pain of Kent State was still with him. And uh, one of the things I cherish about Dick Celeste as governor, one, he was a very bright and able person, and he loved college campuses. And he made it a practice while he was a sitting governor to come to each public university campus in the state, and he would spend two days. And he would teach some classes, and he would spend the night in the residence hall, and uh, generally get some flavor of the campus. He'd been a Rhodes Scholar and uh, ended up, uh, interestingly enough, as the president of a liberal arts college Colorado College. Anyway, uh, Dick Celeste came to campus and uh, we had planned a reception at the end of the, his visit. And someone was to bring him to my office and we were to go over to Baker, the old Baker Center for the reception. And he came into my office and said, Charlie, may I close the door for a moment? I said, of course closed the door and he sat down and he said, now what I want to know is how you can deceive all these students. And I was sort of taken back and I said, what do you mean deceive? He said, they think they're on a small liberal arts campus and they're not a hundred universities the size of this one in the country. Now that's the nicest compliment you could possibly pay us. Uh, Dick Celeste was good to work with because he could take an idea, accept it, uh, tinker with it, and then run with it. And the program Excellence was a good illustration of his running with an idea. Uh, and George Vonovich, of course, is one of our graduates, very loyal, and quite uh, ready to acknowledge his debt to Ohio University and to John C. Baker, uh, but George is his own man, and he would listen to you, as he did, uh, but in the end, he made up his own mind and was influenced only by what he thought he ought to do. Now, that's a good definition of a public servant. Yeah, three very different people, and uh, each of them, in turn, I enjoyed. Uh, I remember traveling. One of the things that came with the medical school is that we had a series of regional teaching centers for the clinical experience. 
And we got one that we really hadn't asked for because of some political maneuvering of the president of the Senate. And when the building was done, uh, the governor went over with me to dedicate the building. And I had just gotten back from a trip to China and uh, we were talking on the plane and I said, well, the students coming to campus now are in fact faculty who've been sent off to work in the coal mines and the rice fields during their re-education. And I thought to myself, that was a dumb thing to say. I could see the wheels turning in his mind. Ah, oh, what a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but I cherish many memories of the, the group. While we're into storytelling, one of my favorite stories that you tell in the book, it's and completely non-related to governors and politicians, but um, back home and back uh, to the convo, is that um, uh, for the once again for the youngsters in the audience, the students, in the mid '80s we had, as we have had uh, now again for the last five or six years, a very fine basketball team, and there were several players in that generation who went on to at least brief careers in the pros. And uh, Charlie tells a wonderful story about the two of them, Dave Jamerson and Snoopy Graham, because he'd be over working out in the, in the weight room and, over, and overheard yeah. this following exchange. Uh, tell him about Jamerson well, uh, and Snoopy. And Dave Jamerson was uh, set an NCAA record for three-point shots. Uh, he played, I don't remember who, but he only missed two shots the whole night. And in both cases, it was because the defensive player was so frustrated he knocked him on his rear. Now, he could shoot uh, just with a grace and a beauty. Uh, I, I, I'm wandering, but I'll go ahead with it. We had Malaysian guests, and we decided to take them to a basketball game. And it happened to be the night when he set Dave Jamerson a, a NCAA record. For 16 three, three points, three pointers. It's and, no longer the record. It's been about yeah, 16, well, not then, bad, huh? <laughs> anyway, the uh, Malaysian guests had never seen a basketball game. So we took them after dinner to the game. And after the game making conversation, I said, did you enjoy the game? And the wife said, well, there really didn't seem very much to it. Said, so you just throw the ball up and it goes through the hoop. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, to get back to the Jamerson, Dave uh, uh, severely injured his knee. And I've had chronic knee problems since my college days. And I had, had uh, some surgery and was rehabbing in the... Uh, Convo room that the team used, and Dave was rehabbing his knee. And so we fell into conversation. And uh, sometime later, when his knee had improved, Dave is out shooting baskets, uh, trying to get his form back. Snoopy Graham, his teammate, probably had more natural athletic ability than anyone I've seen play basketball here. He was a wonder. Uh, and Snoopy says to Dave Jamerson, oh, I wish I could shoot like you. And Jamerson says to Snoopy, Snoopy, you start about a million shots behind. <laughs> he was um, right. Uh, one of the things I felt badly about, or you know, it bothered me um, when we did this before, was that I didn't ask you to talk about the person that you shared the presidency with, and w without uh, whose um, help and um, and guidance and getting you out of town and 
and uh, entertaining a zillion people, and that's clear. I mean, the, these jobs are at least um, a job for a team, and you had a good one, and um, and I wish that you'd talk a bit about that, and also, you know, the, the the burden that comes with the job to the family, to the to that part of your life. Well. Uh. We have been married 62 years now. And it is ter terribly important to have someone in your life who will always accept you. So if you spend a day, as presidents do from time to time, getting meet up, the Post writes an editorial, and there's a student demonstration, and a faculty group comes in to raise cane about something, and you sit at the end of the day and you go home and somebody says, oh, you're not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and she was always uh, my sanity base and had a regular practice of periodically she would call Marie White and say, all right, next weekend the calendar is to be clear. And we would go off on a trip uh, dictated by the book Back Roads and Country Inns. Now, she liked Country Inns. I thought they were a pill because the beds were all too short. But uh, <laughs> it, And uh, without her help, I don't think we would have built the core of friends for the university. Over the course of our 19 years, she entertained over 50,000 people in that home, and entertained them with style and grace. And that made a big difference in the, the efforts of the university to build private support. Charlie, I think uh, I'm getting signs from Scott that uh, the evening is coming to a close, and so we'll let Scott into the... Charlie, I'm, I'm wondering in the last few minutes of the program if you might be willing to take some questions from the audience. I would be overjoyed to take questions. Well, I'll, I'll do all the answering. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll start, since I'm dean of the libraries um, and get to do these things occasionally. So I was in, I was in Japan at Chubu University about three years ago and heard an extraordinary story that I found hard to believe, and it was about squirrels. Oh. <laughs> I'm wondering if you could tell a bit of that. Well, we were actively being courted by a Japanese city to open a campus. Uh, this is sometime in the 80s. They had set aside 25 acres of land. They had raised $25 million to build the first buildings. And all they wanted was us to say yes. And so I visited the campus and talked with the city council. And we entertained the city council in our home. And uh, the marching band came up and serenaded to them. And oh, they thought that was wonderful. And they went home and after Working with the numbers, I came to the painful conclusion it just wouldn't work. So I had to uh, write a note uh, saying, no. Uh, they accepted this with grace. And some time went by, and the mayor of Kamaki City wrote me and said, we are opening a new subway line in, in the fall, and we have a park at the terminus for it. And we were all so impressed with those squirrels that ran all over your campus. Would you please send us a dozen squirrels, <laughs> six males, six female, and maybe they'll people uh, the park with squirrels. <laughs> well, uh, you can't believe how complicated it is to send uh, 
critters like that overseas. Jim Bryant, the vice president for regional higher education, was a man who could do the impossible. And so I said, okay, uh, figure out how to do it. And sure enough, he did. And I have no idea whether the squirrels are running wild in that park or not, but I've always wanted to go back and see. Questions? Well, please. Yeah, whoa, whoa. Oh, I'm okay. Yes. Good friends, man. Thank you very much. As just a little addendum, our daughter was, was in the Peace Corps in Botswana <laughs> and uh, reported that uh, you, you could mention Harvard, Yale, Stanford, and you got blank stares. Mentioned Ohio University? Oh, yes, we know Ohio University. Actually, the largest alumni dinner I ever went to was in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Another question? I don't have a question. I have a, uh, a comment. Uh, I was just going to, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, all the women at Ohio University and the African Americans uh, who are <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but you, you've had a listening ear. I can remember being a part of uh, a five-member uh, delegation of women coming to your office uh, to even talk about uh, getting a women's study uh, program started. And so I just want to say uh, I appreciate you. Thank you. You're very kind. Well, I thought surely somebody would have had a uh, grudge guy coming out <laughs> of the past. Or, uh, some decision that we made that they found troubling and puzzling. Uh, something that we did or failed to do or yes please <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
I do. It got bigger and bigger. Uh, in 75, we had the uh, head of the, the whole, the, the senator who was the head of the program for, uh, and, and then the next year, it was 75, wasn't it? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Is this the, our summer programs? Yes. Clayton Pell is who you're thinking of? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. These were summer Ohio program in the humanities. Just it kept getting bigger. And it did. It did. And Lois was stalwart. It was a part of it. Well, thank you, um, Scott. Thank you very much for coming out on a damp uh, night. Now, before we thank our presenters, I want to put a plug in for this book. It is a wonderful read. It really gives a glimpse into Ohio University's history. There were so many things that I found out that I just didn't know. And what's special for you tonight is that this book is on sale right over there from the Ohio University Press. Normally, it's $49.95. But for you, it's on sale at 30% discount for $34.96. Now, for those on our web audience, you can go to your local bookseller and buy a copy of that. You'll have to pay full price, though. Similarly, you can also buy this from Amazon. Um, and you can even check it out of a library if you so choose. <laughs> so please join me in thanking President Ping and Professor Kropp. Playboy.